Hello. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome to this, the very first session of Six Bridges Book Fest 2023. I'm excited to kick off the fest today with uh, Stephen Aryan. He's the author of The Judas Blossom, which is the first installment in his Persian-inspired fantasy trilogy. He was born in Iran in 1977 and raised in Whitley Bay on the northeast coast of the UK. He has been reading fantasy since a very young age. And after graduating university in 1999, he started working in marketing. Around the same time, he also started submitting work in order in, in an effort to get published. He was finally able to get representation in 2013. He wrote a two-part blog about this experience um, that's available on his website called I Found How I Found an Agent Part One and Part Two. In 2014, um, his book Battle Mage was snatched up by Orbit Books and subsequently published in 2015. It went on to be published in France, Germany, and Russia, and was a finalist for the David Gimmel Morningstar Award for Best Debut Fantasy Novel. Battle Mage went on to win the inaugural Hellfest Inferno Award in France after a public vote. The sequels Blood Mage and Chaos Mage were both published in 2016, completing what this trilogy called The Age of Darkness. He started um, another trilogy called The Age of Dread in 2017. It has three books, Mage Born, Mage Fall and Mage Bane that were published between 2017 and 2019. And in 2018, he also published Of Gods and Men with Orbit, a digital and audio novella, which served as a prequel to Battle Mage. In 2020, he was picked up for a new duology. The story is set in a brand new world. The first novel, The Coward, was published in June 2021, and it received a starred review from Publishers Weekly. The sequel, The Warrior, was published in August 2022. And in 2022, Angry Robot signed The Judas Blossom, the book we're going to discuss today. It debuted in July of this year. The book has been described as an imaginative and sprawling reimagining of the Mongol Empire's invasion of Persia, following the lives of four characters at the center of a war. Today, we'll be focusing our discussion on The Judas Blossom, but welcome audience questions about Stephen's other work as well. Feel free to put those questions in the chat, and we'll cover those in the last part of the session. To go ahead and get started, as we heard in your bio, it took you quite a while to find your way in traditional publishing. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that journey and your relationship with the publishing world? Sure, yes. It's taken, it took a lot of years. So when I first started sending out requests to agents, so I wrote for my first book when I was 19. And of course, it wasn't very good. But at the time, it was the best that I could do. And I thought it was good. And so I immediately started sending out um, inquiries to agents. And back then, it was all on paper. There was no, nothing on the internet. The internet is very primitive. You couldn't just email an agent and see what was going on. So I'd send requests out, get rejected, send out the next one, get rejected, and did that over and over. And once I'd exhausted the list, uh, stopped that book, put it down, started another one, and basically just kept going. And over the years, I went to a lot of events, learned as much as I could from listening to agents talk, editors, publishers. Um, the internet had grown up. Self-publishing became a viable option, but I wanted to go traditional. And it wasn't until I went back to writing a book, I thought I've tried different genres, I've tried different styles, let's write a fantasy book, all the kind of things that I'm I'm not seeing at the moment, but I really love. So I wrote the kind of book that I wanted to read and sent that off again, read it, edit it myself, and my friends read it, edit it again, everything the same as before, sent it out, sent it off to an agent, I said, I'll, I'll send off to one and then I'll work on the rest of the list. And that agent said, this is quite interesting. Can I see some more? So I sent her the full book. And then she subsequently went on to become my agent and she's been my agent ever since. And we're now nine books in. I debuted in 2015 and I've had a book out, as you said, every year apart from 2020. So how many books did you write before that one finally got? <laughs> yes, I've got kind of seven or eight trunk novels, I'd say, over those 13 years. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of rejections, a lot of uh, getting knocked back. Uh, but everybody's has has that kind of a story. They're all slightly different. Stephen King talks about having the nail on his wall. And every time he got a rejection, he'd pin it on. And eventually he had so many. It came out the walls. So he had to get a bigger nail and put even more on. Um, so. You know, I knew that I wasn't going to get it off the bat straight away. And some people do. Some people are lucky. I think I just needed to improve my writing craft, my ability. And I got there eventually. So uh, it, it's all worked out in the end. Um. So 
in this day and age, self-publishing has changed a lot. Have you reconsidered doing self-publishing? Yes. Um, becoming a hybrid author is now a lot more possible. Um, I've just started on kind of a journey of exploring that as an option in parallel with my traditional novels. So I'm now, because I don't know enough about it, I'm talking to lots of people who've done it before me and said, you know, how did you do it? What am I missing? What do I need to know? And I'm just kind of at the beginning of that journey now. So in theory, I'm going to self-publish something maybe next year, but I'm being vague on the date because they don't say, oh, it's definitely this day. And then something happens and oh, I, have, oh, I haven't forgot, I've, I haven't learned how to do this or do that. I'm thinking, yeah, before I jump in, let's gather as much information as I can and learn from all these people who've done it before me and say, what mistakes did you make? What should I avoid? And hopefully uh, I won't fall into the same traps. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so as we were chatting a little bit before we hopped on the video, you mentioned that you have a day job in addition to writing. Mm -hmm. What is like your, what is your normal day look like, I guess, with that in mind? Um, so I, I work at, at my day job two days a week and I write three days a week. And I'm, I'm because from before COVID and everything, I was freelancing at home anyway. And now I don't need to go into the office. I just work at home. So some days are writing days and some days are office days. But um, just over the years, I've been regimented. I get up at the same time five days a week, whether I'm writing or, or, or doing work. And I finish at the same time, my lunchtime, lunch break at the same time. It's the only way I've been able to do it and to get where I am because it's it's discipline over motivation. Some days I don't want to do my day job, but you've got to do it. Some days I don't want to write, but I've got to do it because it's my other job. So it's just keep chipping away at the mountain. And, and that's what I did. Same with working on a first draft. It takes a long time. And so it's just hitting you, my daily word count, knowing I've done so many words. Okay, if I do so many words per day, so many per month, I will get to it and hit my deadline. And I've done it every time. So I've I've got a system that works for me now and I'm I'm sticking with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw this trend on Book Talk and it's kind of a challenge, but I wanted to, I feel like okay. you're ready for a challenge. Um, <laughs> can you describe the Judas Blossom in 10 words or less for people who are just learning about it? Oh, oh god, 10 <laughs> words or less. Okay. Um ooh, Mongols invade Persia. Rebels fight back, war ensues, and chaos. Is that 10? Yeah, that's Same. 10. <laughs> not fire, which I feel like is very important, but that's okay. <laughs> I guess people have to figure that out on their own. Yes. <laughs> um, so historical fantasy is a new genre for me as a reader, and I think you as a writer. Um, can you talk mm. a little bit about your decision to write a book set in this part of the world during the time period and why you chose historical fantasy? Yeah, so my first two trilogies are very traditional epic fantasy, very upfront, overt magic, you know, powerful mages walking around, summoning lightning and stuff. And I never want to repeat myself. I always want to do something uh, different. So after those two trilogies, I did a duology behind me, The Coward and the Warrior. And those were more quest-based fantasy, looking at the old-style quest novels that I read growing up. But I wanted to do something different, a twist, but talk about particular things in those novels, which I did. And then after I've done that, I thought, okay, I've done that for now. I want to do something different again. And because, as you said in the introduction, I was born in Iran. So I have Persian heritage on my dad's side. You know, I haven't, I haven't been there in 40 years since I was a small boy. So, but it's been a part of my life, you know, forever with people in the UK and friends of family and so on and the community around me. And it was just something that had been ticking in the back of my mind. And in the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen a lot more own voices within fantasy there's still room for the more traditional kind of fantasy but now you're getting fantasy inspired by or based upon other parts of the world whether it's asian or, or african or whatever it might be the audiences maybe they've always been open to it but they've been the publishers have been more accepting perhaps of it in the last 10 or 15 years and i thought okay maybe now that i've done a few novels this is probably the right time to do it. I couldn't have done this kind of a novel when I'd first started out because it has been so challenging. Getting the balance right of creating something completely fictional and mixing it with history and blending the two together to create a cohesive story that feels real. And I'm, I've dramatized certain events and I've made some things up, but, but blending all of that together and doing the research on top was an enormous challenge and um, it just was very, very difficult. So I think this was the right time to do it. Once I've got an established kind of audience, they know the kind of story I'm going to tell. And even though the setting is different, 
even though it's something a lot of the readers won't know anything about. To them, it'll just feel like a fantasy world, which is fine. There'll be strange terms. They don't know whether it's fantasy or you know, Middle Eastern terms. That's fine. There again, it's um, it, it's just trying to create something that's fresh for the audience. And I think it is. We were saying before we start recording that as far as I know, this is the first Persian-inspired historical fantasy series. There's been historical fiction set within this world and there's been historical fiction novels about the Mongols. But there's never been a fantasy series from both perspectives, from the invaders and the people being invaded and how they want to fight back in a rebellion. Um, so I did a lot of research um, over the years, probably the last three or four years before I started writing this. When I was working on my other novels, it was kind of in the background. And it was just gradually I pieced the things together and then started writing it and pitched it to my agent. And she liked the idea and it pitched it to my editor and they were keen and and they bought the trilogy and 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 here we are, you know, book one is out, book two next year, book three, uh, 2025. So work ahead, lots of work ahead to keep me busy. Um, so obviously with your background, um, there's a lot of Persian food and culture in the book. Is mm -hmm. there a specific aspect of that you'd like to highlight for readers to make sure they keep an eye out for it? <laughs> the food, especially, yeah. Uh, yeah, I I love the Persian food. Um, I've been eating all my life. You know, it's it's just so delicious. It's so hard to describe to other people when you talk about other cultures' food. They say, "Oh, is it is it spicy? Is it this? Is it that?" And it's really hard to describe. But I've I've done my best, and just introducing aspects of the culture that for those readers who are familiar with things like the um, the kind of willing to pay for someone's dinner, even though you don't really want to, and but they want to pay for you. And this kind of, it's thing, it's called tar off in, in, in Farsi, where there's so think little things I've trickled in here and there that I've just had, you know, as part of my life, um, you know, even though I live in the UK. And so I thought it'd be fun to introduce them to other people. The, the best compliments I've had from people who've read the book is they've said, I now want to go away and find out more about both this part in history, but also the cultures that you've been talking about. And I think that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so this book to me sort of read like an introduction to the universe. We get a lot of like world building and character development and the beginning of some of what I think will be the larger plot arcs. Um, one of my favorite fantasy authors, V.E. Schwab, describes this phenomenon of writing as slow books. Um, do you think it's a slow book? Do you is that not what you were going for? I'm just curious as a reader if like <laughs> is what you're trying to get across or if if I'm if I miss some important things. <laughs> no, no. So I, I don't think it's a slow book. It's not we were talking saying that you know some fantasy books are huge tomes. They're six, seven, eight hundred pages and they can be slow or they can just be so immersive that you soak your world in and you just spend, you know, days lost in them. All of my books are pretty lean. The prose is fairly tight. Um, I prefer to create charcoal sketches of characters and let readers fill in the blanks. I don't want to go into too much detail. The prose isn't particularly purple. No one's ever described that of my books before. So they're all pretty like lean, uh, lean books, uh, short chapters, quite punchy, um, focus on character. There is obviously some world building, probably more in this book than I've done in others. And I had to kind of, get the balance right. I, I've done a lot of research on this area and this part of history, but I didn't want to just say, I've done all the research, now you're going to read about it, even though it's not relevant to the plot, I'm putting it in there. That's how I <laughs> end up with a 700 page book. And I thought, yeah, let's let's not do that. So sometimes I'd say to my editor, is this, do I, does this make sense? Does this need to be in there? Is it relevant? And sometimes we've trimmed things out because it it slowed the plot down or I've wandered off somewhere in, you know, down an alleyway of, of in, some, an interesting fact that I thought this would be good to share with the readers. And it's like, well, do they really need to know it? Um, so there's four main perspectives, five really about a kind of a group of people in the book and all of them weave together. So by the end of the first book, it's moved a lot of the characters on from where they started to where they end up at the end of the book. They're very different characters, two of them in particular. And the others have progressed i would say in other ways two of them are very obvious how they've changed um they'll have more growth i would say than other characters but there's still the major events are going to impact on everybody so even if the characters aren't driving the events some of the other events in that era of of history are so explosive because the mongol empire was so big and there's so many things happening to them as well as them going out and doing other things that um 
it's going to be there's there's a lot going on in the books i'd say i don't think they're particularly slow but there's a lot of information so it's trying to get that balance right between action and pace and character and world building and it was a challenge yeah that's for sure and i didn't mean slow in a bad way like no that's fine (laughs) three or four days um so you know i yeah it's just you know not constant action a lot of getting to know folks um which i liked um and i was a little nervous when i picked up the book because i had read a little bit about your background i knew that you wrote a lot of like war heavy fighting style fantasy books and that's not really been my personal preference and mm-hmm. so i was like oh, i'm gonna pick it up i'm gonna read it i'm interested and then i was like <laughs> oh, no this isn't this isn't at all was that what i was expecting um i feel like it's a really human book um so yes. i i really liked that too um and there's two historical main characters in the book hulagu khan and mm-hmm. koko chin um what inspired you to include include them specifically in the story versus other historical characters you could have integrated yeah so with writing about this part of the mongol empire the 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 story starts in 1260 and during that period the mongol empire covered an enormous part of the the known world and it got so big that it was split into four areas or khanates and in the same period people will know the name kublai khan because he's a lot more well known so he was the brother of Halagu Khan, and he was ruling over in what is modern day China, Mongolia, and they were invading parts of China. But no one's told the stories in the fantasy way about Halagu and saying what was going on in modern day Iran, Iraq, Persia, Afghanistan, and all around the Caucasus area. So having him as one of the main characters, I thought was important because he's one of the main drivers of events in that area. Um, the reason I included Kokachin is historically there's there's a big question mark about her and there's not a lot of information known which is when I'm writing historical fantasy is is good because it means I can introduce a lot more fiction um the book all of the main events in the book that are historically accurate in terms of they happened in that sequence who was there and how it happened I've had to manipulate and change sometimes a war would go on for kind of three years and I can't just sort of kind of say and I will have a war for three years because that's like five books in itself. So I've accelerated certain events. But Kokachin, from what we know about her historically, in the travels of Marco Polo, he um, was, Kublai Khan says, right, you're going to escort her from Mongolia, from the capital Karakorum, all the way to Persia. And when, he, when she gets there, you're going to hand her off to the Khan and she's going to marry him. And um, took two years of Marco Polo to travel and make that journey. By the time they arrived in Persia, the person she was going to marry had died and his son had become the Khan. So she married him, you know, as you do. And and three years later, according to historical records, she was dead. So we know nothing about her. And I thought, well, there's a big question mark there thinking, you know, did she die? And if she didn't, what happened to her and what was she doing there and she's had this enormous journey over two years which must have changed her from a very young woman to kind of traveling across the mongol empire and seeing it and then arriving in this world where she doesn't know anybody the person she was even going to marry who she's never met it's not him anymore and so there's just a lot of well what happens next and and who was she and how does she adapt to being a, a complete stranger in a strange land where she doesn't know the culture um, and I thought that's that gives me a lot of opportunities to tell some interesting stories. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you talked about the uh, the I forget exactly what the title of it is, but the about Marco Polo's journey yeah. um, across the empire. Um, what other historical sources did you use to shape these characters? I've got a stack of books behind me <laughs> that I used. Um, the other thing I was saying before is there's I, I read a lot, but it's a case of I had to forget certain things because it would slow the book down. There are a lot of unfamiliar terms that, you know, it, the predominantly readers initially for this book will be you know, English readers until it gets translated into other languages. So it's going to be, you know, UK and America and Canada and, um, and Australia and then places like that. But I was I was conscious of if I introduce too many words that are unfamiliar that are not English, that'll slow people down. I'm already creating and showing them a world that they're not familiar with, a lots of terms there again, that can slow them down. And if there's too many hurdles 
it'll just knock them out of the world and they won't be immersed in the story and be invested in the characters. So I was very conscious of saying, right, I'm going to forget that. I'm going to use a different term. So in the Mongolian uh, army, they have different terms for somebody who looks after, I think it's 10, 100 and 1,000 soldiers. And it's a specific word that isn't an English word. And I thought, that's going to trip people up straight away. So I've used familiar ranks like, you know, uh, sergeant, captain, general, just so that, okay, I know what this kind of level is compared to this guy. I understand how it works. He's looking after the whole of the army or whatever it might be. So, yeah, I forgot a lot of stuff on purpose. And it wasn't that I didn't know it. It's that it's still fiction. It's still fantasy. There's a lot of stuff in there that I have made up. And it's historically accurate, but only up to a point. because. I just otherwise I would be completely locked in by events and there'd be no wiggle room and it would just be pure historical fiction at that point. And I wanted to have some creative freedom to create other things without without spoiling it too much. There is a fantastical element in the story um, that affects some of the characters, but it doesn't change everything radically. Like there's a, a French author, author called uh, Pierre Perval who did a series of fantasy books about the French Revolution but there's dragons. So on the front cover, you've got guys in full suits of armor riding a dragon during the French Revolution. You know what you're getting. This is very much not history. Mine's a lot closer to history. You're not going to have dragons pop up, but there's still some weird stuff in there that people who are familiar with my other fantasy novels will go, oh, okay, this is this is a bit interesting. What, what's this? And then we have to explore it. I have to explain it because it is purely made up. Um. Yeah, and I think that for me, you know, knowing it was historical fantasy going in, I kept waiting. I was like, when do we, when do we get it? Like, what is it going to be? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think that's really fun as a reader, so I won't spoil it for anyone either. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, personally, Coco Chen was my favorite character, maybe because she's like the most uh, highlighted female. I don't exactly know. I just really enjoyed uh, mm -hmm. reading her, her experiences. But I'd like to know who your favorite character was to write. That's difficult. People say, "Who's your favorite character ever?" I'm like, it's a Sophie's choice. They're all they're all my children, really. <laughs> um, I, I like writing characters that are so that are very very not me. Um, as a writer, when I when everybody starts out, I think we write what's familiar. We write people that we know, people that we've met, and people who'd read my early work have said, "I can see you in this character. I can see so and so that you know is in this character." But as I've gone further on. I don't think any of the characters are like me. Um, one of the characters, Kayvon, uh, my partner read it and she said, he's got your sense of humor. But apart from that, I can't see anything else in there. <laughs> Some of his sarcasm, that's you. But uh, uh, everything else she said, it isn't, isn't you. Um, and it's like trying on different pairs of, of shoes, writing different characters. So Halago is very, very driven by the idea of destiny, by the idea of fulfilling his grandfather's dream. And, you know, he's very arrogant and he has this kind of inbuilt belief that it, it just will happen because destiny has willed it so. But then you get the other characters that are very much looking at him thinking, well, he's he's just unhinged. Who does he think he is? And, you know, why should he get to rule the world? So it's it's interesting to play with all of them and, and write from different perspectives and having write, writing about both the Mongol characters and the Persian characters who are being invaded and occupied. I get to explore uh, both sides of the story and I, I really like that uh, I was definitely determined to do that for sure um who did you find the most challenging to write mm, uh probably Hilagu actually because historically he is a, a very very brutal character the Mongols you know did a lot of very very terrible things that we, and I've toned down what they did in the book believe it or not there's a lot of things I didn't include there again because they were so horrific. Yeah. But I didn't want to make him just a mustache twirling villain and that just feels very cardboard cutout. So I had to make him human. I had to find the humanity in him. And some of it is, is historically true. So this isn't a spoiler. This is fact. And this is in the book. He had many wives and many concubines, but one of his wives traveled with him. Whenever he went to war, she went with him. So he'd be, you know, sleeping in yurts and fighting on the battlefield. She went with him everywhere he went. And I thought for her to do that, to give up the comforts of living in a palace and have servants and be, you know, hundreds of miles away from the war, there must be something there. And he would obviously love her to, to sacrifice this herself 
to come with him and deal with all this hardship. And so I made him have strong relationships with his children because he obviously cherished them and wanted them to do well. His his war wife, as she was called. And so it was it was finding the humanity in him, even though he did some very, very terrible things, which are in the book, and he had terrible rages. And so it was still kind of, I need to show both sides of him. And so having the character moments, as you said, if it was constantly war after war after war in the book and every battle, you'd just be like, this guy's terrible and he's just killing all these people and he's a monster. You know, most of the time he was, but then when he stepped away and he went and spoke to his children or grandchildren, you know, he was a very different character. So it, getting that balance right, I think, was probably the toughest thing for me. Yeah, I found um, myself feeling bad for him several times. And I was like, I don't want to feel bad. <laughs> it worked. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, he's supposed to be garbage, I think. So, um, you not know, historically, guy, no. not the best guy. But no. yeah, I definitely, there were moments where I was like, oh, Poor Hulago. <laughs> <laughs> I've done my job well then. If, if you're yeah. feeling that, if you're feeling something for him other than hate, then yes. I've done my job yeah. well. I mean, there so were definitely worked. moments, you know, with the whole uh, rape, pillaging, murder, that whole bit. Mm -hmm. not, not my favorite, but yeah. um, on in that vein, he's he is historically known for his brutality as well as like the rest of the Mongols. Mm. Um, with your other book series, you've kind of garnered a reputation for writing immersive, brutal battle scenes. Um, was it important for you that that element come through in this book or were you trying to like get away from that a little bit? I didn't want to do too many battles. I, I wanted to show um, some of them because they were important events. Um, historically, I won't spoil it, but there's a big um, battle where they sack a city in the book and that's historically accurate. That, that had to happen for various other events. And so, I, sometimes when I was editing the book, my editor would say to me, can we change this thing? And I'd say, we can, but have this knock-on effect in all these places because I'm dancing between the raindrops of historical events. So showing, showing some of the battles was important, but I think it was more important to show the after effects because the characters, uh, most of the characters are are set in within Persia for the story. So it's showing the war is that the, the invasions already happened. Now they're occupying Persia. How did the people respond to that? How did they cope with that? And then they're going on to fight the next, uh, invade the next country, the next city. And we're seeing little bits of it. But there again, I need to show well, what does that impact does that have on the people who are left at home? How does it affect the people who are going to war all of the time? Um, so I didn't just want too many battles, but it was important to show some of it so people understood the brutality and the, the destruction that was so wholesale in places where they wiped places off the map completely that no longer exists and they're just ruins. Um, but then you get to some historical interesting things like the order of assassins, which is real. Uh, we use that word every day now to mean a hired killer of any kind. But back then it was a very specific group and that's historically accurate too. Chapter one opens with where they're attacking um, the fortress of Alamet, which was a, a fortress in the north of Persia run by the Order of Assassins. And that's historically true. They did sack it and lay siege to it. And these were very specialist hide killers that would operate in that period. Um, and there again, I needed to show some of it because of the knock-on effects of the story, but I didn't want to just have a 50-page battle and a little break and another 50-page battle. I wanted to focus on the people as much uh, and make, them, make you feel for some of them as you've done. <laughs> All of them, unfortunately. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, well, I had a question about the fantasy elements, but it sounds mm. like you really want to keep that a surprise for readers. So can we talk don't... a little bit. I can try and dance around it if you want. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess maybe my question, I can ask a broader question. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel it was important to add fantasy elements? Because I think that this book could have been written as kind of a more liberal historical fiction and you could have messed with the timeline and stuff without throwing in the fantasy element um you are traditionally a fantasy author but mm. why why was it important for you to include that in the book I, I think moving to a completely new genre as a writer can have its downfalls and and pluses sometimes you capture a completely new audience but then again nobody knows you so if I'd stepped into writing, writing a crime novel after fantasy some people just be like who so this is kind of a good bridge between the two so I'm getting fantasy readers who probably wouldn't normally try historical fiction, but because it says historical fantasy, oh, and they know what I kind of write. They're like, all right, I'll, I'll give it a try. And they've been surprised. Um, 
because I was having a lot of fiction in there anyway, I've introduced all sorts of things that are completely made up and I've mirrored existing things. Um, I, I, the fantasy, so there's a, there's a magic system. I'll say that in the books, it's based loosely on something that's real that there again, I thought, what if I extrapolate that to the next level and what, what would happen? And, and there again, and it seemed to fit in when I've created one of the characters, I wanted to kind of explore a very different kind of story with him and what would happen to him as he went through this kind of transition and this role of discovery. It allowed me to do certain things with the story that I couldn't do if I just made it a purely historical fiction novel. Um, it allows me to explore different ideas as well that we know during this period they were exploring the idea of, of, of gunpowder and black powder and using it to explode things. But if you take something even more powerful and you introduce it into this era, how would it affect warfare? How would it affect the world? How would it affect the expansion of the Mongol Empire? And those are kind of interesting questions that I thought I'd like to explore by having this kind of extra fantasy element. Um, yeah, and I like that a lot of times those elements are given to folks with the least amount of agency in that society, which I mm. think is great because it's like you're giving them a little bit of a leg up to to deal with these icky Mongols. <laughs> 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 like a better description. Um, so I appreciated that as a reader. I always love to see folks that are um, that are under oppression getting getting some extra points um, to just kind of wrap up our planned questions and then we'll move to audience questions. Hmm. What do you hope people take away from this book and kind of the series overall? I, I hope, so in the front of the book, I've got an author's note that sort of says, you know, I've, I've, I've done my research, I've done my homework, but there again, I'm telling a dramatic story. So I want readers to, first of all, I want them to have had a fun read and to have enjoyed the adventure and have been invested in the characters and hopefully feel something for them, good and bad. That's what I want, first of all. Um, the, the best comments and the best feedback I've had from people is that they've said they enjoyed finding out about a part of history that they knew nothing around. And they've also learned a lot about some other cultures that they, they're not familiar with. Like nobody particularly writes much about 13th century Persia in fiction. So it's very brand new to the audience. And some have then gone on to say, I'd like to go and find out more about this period in history. I'd like to find out more about this culture and what was going on in there. And some people have said, I now want to go and find out what parts are real and what parts are fiction. So they've gone off to kind of explore that idea. So things like the Zerkana, the House of Strength, which is real, it's a real system, a real kind of martial art and sport and wrestling art that's still performed today. People have, have messaged me and said, oh, I've, I've just been looking at that on YouTube and it's real. I'm like, I know, I know it's real. That part's real. I didn't make it up. So I hope people explore this kind of thing. Um, and I, I want them to have a fun read. I want them to have a good adventure. Uh, and it, it won't, hopefully it won't feel like anything they've read before because it is so different in terms of the place in the world and, and the place in history, I think. it's uh, it, it stands apart, I think. Um, recently, my husband and I were looking at videos of the House of Strength on, I think it was mm -hmm. TikTok, something like something just showed up in one of our feeds. And it was like, they're like losing this art. And I was like, they should just market it like CrossFit. It's like really intense Persian CrossFit. <laughs> it's pretty intense physical workout. Yeah, yeah. And the whole kind of clubs that they use and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, it's like this it's crazy. Strength. People should look it up. There's TikToks and stuff. Get out there. Look it up. The, the, you know, there's a weird connection between the House of Strength and the re and WWE, you know. Back oh. in American wrestling. Yeah, yeah. So there was a, there's a character back in the 80s that wrestled in the early 90s called the Iron Shake. But he was originally Persian. And his gimmick was he'd come out and he'd have the clubs from the house of strength that he'd so go the back in the days of hulk hogan all that kind of day the iron shake was a villain and but they just kind of made him a generic villain but that's what he used to wield but he was originally a persian wrestler huh. who went over to america and trained with the tour olympic teams and then eventually got into wrestling and then became a wrestler himself so there's a weird link that i discovered whilst i was doing my yeah, research rabbit holes after this it sounds like uh-huh <laughs> i have to go look him up now <laughs> Um, well, I'll move to audience questions. Let me scroll through and see what we've got. Um, Derek Rudkin just had a comment. He says, good 10 word ad. So I put you on. You. you did Thank it. You. Um, Phoenix says, um, I was pleasantly surprised that Coco Chen is queer. 
Can you talk about the choice to make her queer and why you thought that that was going to be important? Yeah, I think representation is important, but also during this period in history and this part of the world, the cultures are very, very different and how women would have been treated would be very, very different in terms of first class and second class citizens. But the, the truth of the matter is the Mongol Empire couldn't have existed without the women back home. Whilst the men went off to fight war, it was the women who ran everything and kept everything going. And it, not just in terms of, of, of business, but being able to fund the war so that they have enough money to feed the horses and to buy supplies and do all this. So there's a lot of strong female characters that historically would have actually been there, but they're not really talked about. And I thought with such an interesting culture and with such a mix, there would be some people like that. And so why not have a character like Kokachin? And because she's been thrust into this world, she'd been trained in a particular way to become the perfect wife. And then when she gets there, he's never really there. He's off fighting the wars and she's left at home by herself. And so it allowed her to explore not only the culture, but also herself and her own feelings. And so it was only during part of that process that she realized she was. It wasn't something that was, you know, always going to happen. It was just as I started exploring the story, it made sense based upon where she was and who she was surrounded by. Yeah, yeah. Um, we got any other ones? Anybody else got a question? Are there, uh, from Mark, are there other eras you might want to explore after this trilogy? That is a good question. <laughs> um, so in this period, the Mongols, obviously, the Mongol Empire was starting to actually come apart because there was a lot of civil war and a lot of issues. It's whether or not I go to another part of the world within the same period or I jump forward or I jump back because the story is set in, in 1260 and this is the era of Genghis Khan's grandsons, kind of 80 years after he'd invaded and occupied certain places. And but a lot of people have written about Genghis Khan, so I'm, I probably wouldn't write about him. I might jump forward to a later century to see how the world had changed there again. One thing we take, we talk about this in our society now and in the world now and in the 21st century is how connected we are in terms of communications and how you and I are talking now, we're in different parts of the world, different time zone, but you and I are talking face to face. But back then they had fantastic communications. Um, the Mongol Empire was famed for its road system and its transport system, its messenger system, where someone would ride sort of 20 miles in a fast horse, get off, get on another one, ride another 20 miles. And that's how they could transport messages very, very quickly. But in the story, um, some of the people write to the King of France, the King of England, the Pope, they actually sent letters and we, they're historical documents, you can find them. So the world was a lot more connected than we probably presume. So I, I might explore something to do with that. Um, some people say, why didn't I make this more, more fantastical or more kind of Persian mythology inspired story? And that's something there again, potentially I, I could do, but it would veer a lot more back into the kind of pure fantasy realm, but setting it within Persian mythology, there again, people don't know a lot about that period, you know, the, the Shahnameh and some of the big creatures and some of the famous stories. There are parallels that are quite interesting. So everyone knows about Hercules and the trials of Hercules that he had to overcome. But there's a similar character in Persian mythology called Rustam, who had his trials that not the same, but there's different ones. So maybe a story exploring Persian mythology and Persian mythological characters would be an interesting thing to do. Um, I, I guess I guess we'll see if people want more of this kind of story. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do more mythology. Yeah. See, you've got ideas. <laughs> More ideas and time. This is the problem. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah, I noticed, too, that you integrated some Persian poetry into the book, which I thought was really great just because of the tradition of poetry that is so integral to Persian culture. Um, so I just wanted to point that out for readers if they don't pay attention. Yes. To notice it overtly. It is um, a great addition for sure. There's, yeah, because it's a big part of their, their culture, music, poetry, art, obviously uh, uh, the, the wrestling with the Zerkana, other things, all these are part of the culture, the food. And so I wanted to bring in some of that. So every, there's different sections of the book and they have uh, poetry or a quotation from someone um, related. And in the second and the third book there again, even the, the title is comes from 
uh, something to do with poetry as well. So Persian poetry. So that's where the title comes from too. That was actually my next question was where <laughs> does the Judas Blossom tie in to the story? Like what, why that title? So there's a, there's a very long Persian uh, poet, a poem by, I think it's Rumi. And he talks about the beauty of the Judas Blossom. But the title here kind of summons that part of the world, that history, but also refers to something a bit more direct and the fact that the name Judas has many connotations to it. And so it is inspired uh, by that. I mean, the, the title of the trilogy is The Nightingale and the Falcon. And a couple of people have said, why? The Nightingale is the national bird of Iran and the, the Falcon is the national bird of Mongolia. So it, because given that the book is about the war between these two great cultures and the fact that they've invaded and they're fighting back, that's the reason for the name of the trilogy and for the name of the book. So there you go. Yeah, I was thinking maybe <laughs> later, like somebody would get called that or something that would become what they were known as. But someone uh, say, I never saw the Nightingale. Where was that? I'm like, <laughs> you have to think a little bit more outside the box, do a little bit more research, and then a little bit uh, more abstract for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a bit more, yeah. Ashley says she would love to see some per Persian mythology novels. So you've okay. got you've got some support in the chat. I've got a reader. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> um, and then um, Mark has shared a link to where we can find your books in our library system. And mm -hmm. um, our bookstore partner has shared where they can purchase your books. So um, I think we can probably start to wrap. I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Um, I have two more to ask, though. Okay. Um, what authors inspire you and what are you currently reading? Oh, okay. okay. That's a long, long question to answer. Well, <laughs> I can eat up minutes, some time then. with that. So. <laughs> um, so growing, growing up, I read, um, I started with Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, the, the Narnia books. Um, then I went on to read um, David Eddings, uh, Terry Brooks with the Shannara series. When I was a teenager, David Gemmell was a big influence on me and to, and he remains in terms of people have said my books similar to his in style sometimes which i take as a huge compliment um ursula Le Guin for the magic systems and the kind of interesting aspects that she brought in um margaret weiss and tracy hickman are a pair of american authors that i don't think get enough praise they're very well known for the dragonlance novels and for doing books tied into role-playing games and systems but as we were saying back then, the internet didn't exist growing up. So I had no idea. I just read the books and thought they were amazing. But they were really inspirational for me because they they showed me what fantasy could be. I'd been reading swords and sorcery novels for years, you know, the farm boy and things. But then they'd, they'd done that. But then they did a trilogy that's inspired by the Middle East called the Rose of the Prophet um, trilogy. And I'd, I'd never seen anything like that before. And then they did a seven book series called the Death Gate Cycle, which has tattoo magic and people that are hopping between worlds and a sort of spaceship type thing. And I'm thinking, this is fantasy. It, it, it was like nothing I'd ever read growing up before. And it just I suddenly I, had, I felt like I'd had blinkers on for years thinking this is what fantasy is. And suddenly they just came off and I thought it can be anything. It can be whatever I want. It can be dragons, but it doesn't have to be. It could be something you know, just whatever I can imagine. Um, and so I just, I started playing around with ideas then, but other people like Dean Kuntz, Stephen King, Lovecraft, the kind of horror aspect that creeps into some of my books and there's some kind of Cthulhu mythos that in, influenced some, some of my earlier books. There's some ideas in there that I've explored. There's, there's so many, there's so many books and you can see them behind me, some of them, um, that I'm I'm constantly reading. I know some fantasy or just some authors don't read within the genre that they're writing they say it feels too much like a busman's holiday that they can't read the same kind of thing as they're writing but for me a really good fantasy book drives me and I'm, I'm not trying to imitate them I'm thinking this is really really good and it just kind of fires me up and I think oh yeah I want to I want to get on and crack on with my book so people like Robin Hobb write the most beautiful soul-destroying books that will make you cry for days um, but um, they are still inspirational and they are fantastic. And I think, okay, yeah, I want to get on with my book. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly energized by reading fantasy rather than being kind of distracted by it. Um, recent, more recent people, John Gwynn, Joba Crombie, um, Lavi Tidar is a very interesting writer. 
I still read read science fiction as well. Up, up, up above, you can see the kind of Expanse novels that I love. Um, Christopher Rocchio is someone I've come across very recently. He writes science fantasy, which is really interesting. More like a Star Wars type thing, but it's still very much sci-fi. Um, yeah, I have a long, long list of, of readers, uh, 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 books that I want to read and uh, other authors that inspire me that I'm constantly just being... Um, I'm surprised by them. I find new ones all the time. Tad Williams, of course, I didn't mention him. Um, growing up, I read Sorrow, Memory and Thorn as a teenager, which is a very famous trilogy that he's now revisited 25 years later and is writing the sequel series as, as we speak. So that, and I met him last weekend, actually, at the UK Writing Festival. He was over here in the UK and I got to meet him and got my book signed by him. So that was was rather wonderful. Um, yeah. There again, meeting him made me want to go away and keep working on, on the next Judas Blossom book. So what am I reading at the moment? That's a good question. I do actually have it right here. Oh, it is that. The Traitor by Anthony Ryan. This is book three in The Covenant of Steel. Uh, Anthony Ryan is a British fantasy author. And I, I interviewed him on my YouTube channel a while ago. And we talked about the series and he sort of, he liked exploring the idea of a Joan of Arc type character, a type of person who has visions of the future prophetic dreams of what is going to come to pass if she doesn't get involved and take you know take charge of events and he's playing around with that idea and it's it's a really really good trilogy so i'm on book three already i'm like it just came out and i've got to read it i put down the other book i'd nearly finished <laughs> i've got to read this one now. <laughs> you're like i'll pick that back up later <laughs> I'll, I'll, it, it was good but this i've got to read this now you know I've just yeah, got yeah. my hands on this Been there, done I, that. Yeah. I need to know what's going on you know um, so you happen. mentioned your YouTube channel briefly. You are a prolific YouTuber. Um, what do you get up to on the platform? How can people, <laughs> can you share some of that? Yeah. So I, I originally started the, the YouTube channel because I was, I was upset that the amount of information out there about traditional publishing that wasn't accurate. And I kept seeing a lot of that on YouTube. And I thought that's not true. And that's not true. And people are saying things about it. And um, the majority of writers on youtube who have writing channels are self-published authors and i watch them to learn things about them but some of them are on there and rather than saying self-publishing is an alternative they say it's the only option and that traditional publishing shouldn't happen it's it's dangerous it's damaging it's awful i'm sitting there thinking that's not that's not true so i started putting out videos about the truth from my experiences over the last 10 years and as part of that um i wanted to explore how other authors became published because everyone's story is completely different. And so I've got about 30 or 40 interviews on there with some traditionally published and self-published authors talking about, you know, how did you, how did you get your break? How did you get an agent? How long did it take? How many books did you write? What are you working on now? What have you, you know, what are you doing next? And I just like hearing their stories because they're never the same. Everyone's overcome different obstacles and it, I think hearing that helps other people who are struggling because, as we said, it took me a long time to get an agent. And the constant rejections are really, really difficult that you think, you know, what, what, what am I not doing right? What haven't I learned? And in the early days, it was difficult to get feedback. Now, it's a little bit better. You may not get feedback from a literary agent, but there are other ways to get feedback. You can consult a professional editor and get them to read your book and give feedback on what's not working and some people do that before they try and get an agent and some you know wait until they're in the editing cycle so I, I talk about what it's like to be a traditionally published author I talk about the process the different stages your book goes through I, I give advice from things that I'm constantly learning and now I'm starting to explore self-publishing I'm kind of um, doing a diary of my adventure into it, saying, right, this is what I've learned so far. This is stuff I don't understand. I've got all these frustrations. I'm going to need to talk to a bunch of other authors to find out, you know, what am I missing? So I'm going to talk to them about designing art for the cover, you know, maps, editing process that they go through because they hire the editor. I don't hire the editor. It's just done by my publisher. Um, how do they market their books? How do they promote them? What about advertising? How much are they spending? All these things I don't do as a traditionally published author. The publisher does all of that. But this time I do. I would do all of it and I'd pay for all of it. So there's there's a lot to learn. And I've got to balance that in between part-time day job and doing my traditionally published novels. But it's it's an interesting process to learn. There's, there's just so much to learn 
Um, but yeah, I've I've been on YouTube for I think two years now, or two or three years, and I've got more interviews lined up and I'll just keep talking about books that I like as well. People have started asking me, can you recommend some books? And so I've started, I don't review books like some booktubers, but um, I do talk about books that are, that are important or special or interesting um, and series that I've enjoyed and why. Because people always say, I've, I've read your books, you know, what would you recommend next? And that's quite such a broad question. It's like, what, what kind of stories do you like? And then I can direct them a little better. So that's awesome. what I'm doing now. Well, I hope, Hope that folks are listening and will check out your YouTube channel. Um, that's where I did a lot of my homework. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think if I'll just ask the audience one more time if they got anything else. It looks quiet in there. So, all right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and close. Thank you so much for joining us for this first session of Six Bridges Book Fest. I hope that the attendees will check out the rest of the amazing sessions and the rest of your great trilogy. So, thank you. Yeah. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. Bye.